It's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Stephanie Portnoy. Uh, you were born in Krakow in Poland, here in your beautiful apartment in Netanya. And Stephanie, you're going to tell us the most incredible life story. So I'm so grateful to you, and um, please, if you could let us start. a little okay. bit of your you on Thank your you life. very much for doing it. I know how many you've done, and it's amazing. So I'm going to read um, what I want to say, because I have some memory problems uh, that some of us do as we get older, and that's on top of the tendency to forget unpleasant things. Um, nevertheless, what I'm going to relate is true. I may not remember some of the details, but I have had to record my recollections in writing on several occasions during my, for example, when I was making a claim for compensation. So they wanted to ask all sorts of questions and I tried to record it. I have used these documents that I've got to produce a more complete history than I could have now recounted if I had relied on my memory. When I was born, in February 1940, I was named Stefania Selina Hoffman. All my life I have been a sort of detective, trying to find out the facts of what happened to me when I was a small child. Even now I find information, just recently from time to time I get new information and the latest one was in March 19, 2019. For years, I have repeated my understanding that my mother was sized by the Germans around the time of my second birthday. But in March 2019, I received clear proof from the tracing service that this happened when I was 12 or 13 months old, which makes my survival even more a miracle than I had believed. Until I was 20, my actual date of birth was always a bit of a mystery. Until then, I believed it was February the 12th, that's what everybody told me. However, there was a very distant aunt, basically a friend of the family, who used to send me a birthday card every year on February the 2nd. Well, that was helpful because my family then decided it was a good reminder to buy me a present, only a week to go. I actually found my true date of birth from, from a German lawyer who was helping me to make my restitution claim. He sent me a copy of my birth certificate and I was born on the 19th of February, 1940. And then I learned my middle name. I didn't know I had a middle name, Stefania Selina Hoffman. I only knew myself as Stefania. Of course, now I'm called Stephanie to be more anglicized. My father was Rudolf Hoffman and he was born on the 19th of February, 1909. My mother's name was Regina, although everyone called her Rena. Her maiden name was Poland, and she was born in 1915. I was born in Krakow, a city in southern Poland. The Second War, World War had just started on September the 1st, 1939, when the German army invaded and soon conquered Poland so that when I was born, they had already been occupying the country for some months. They used Krakow as a capital during the occupation of Poland. Before the war, Krakow had a huge Jewish population, but very few survived. Indeed, in the whole of Poland, less than one in 10 of Jews survived. I can never know why I was chosen by God to be one of those who survived. I know I lived with my parents in a very nice apartment above the factory that manufactured finest glass and on optical lenses. The factory was managed by my father who owned it together with a few other relatives. My mother was an accountant, that's what I heard from other people. From photographs I have received over the years mostly from my uncle. It seems to me that I was very well cared for and I was a very happy baby. And I just want to show you the photograph. Okay. 
The uncle who gave me this photograph was my mother's brother. His name was Adolf po Poland, but everyone called him Dolok. I don't suppose in that period Adolf was a very popular name in Poland. He played a very crucial role in my survival and I have a photograph of him. This is Dolok. If they made a film of his life story, I, don't, I doubt if people would believe it, but then this talk is not about him. I know that my mother had a sister, everyone called her Tosha, but her real name was Antonia. She, was also, she also didn't survive. For the first year of the war, the Germans did not really enforce the most severe decrees against the Jews, so I actually have one or two photographs of myself as a little child with my parents. However, the Nazis then introduced the Jews requiring to wear the yellow star and then the ghetto started and so forth. However, the Germans left my father alone in the factory. He had to continue working in the factory under their constant supervision. He lived where we had lived, in the family flat above the factory. However, they sent him away once they realised that they knew everything about the factory. He died in Gossen, a sub-camp of Mauthausen, concentration camp near Linz in Upper Austria. When he disappeared, my mother fled, taking me with her, and she took refuge with her family outside the country, in, outside Krakow. One day, she decided to go and visit her brother-in-law, who was hiding with his family nearby. Unfortunately, during her visit, the Germans raided the premises and they were taken away, including my mother, and I never saw her again. As I have already said, I know that this happened shortly after my first birthday. The odd thing is that until a few years ago, I had her wedding ring, but it was lost, and that's very sad. It was given to my uncle by a friend of my parents who met him by chance after the war. Much later, he passed it on to me. I know it was my mother's wedding ring because the inscription inside said her date of marriage, but I don't suppose I'll ever know how it survived and she did not. That is another of the many mysteries. After my mother was arrested, the family who was looking after me were very frightened. That They thought that the Gestapo might force her to tell them where she was hidden. That would have meant my discovery and of course this, the death of the people who I was living with. My uncle, therefore, took me to a small house where a widow was living on her own and she agreed to look after me. However, she had very, very strict conditions. She would be out at work all day as a washerwoman and while she was away, I had to remain in a cupboard and never leave it. However, these are the conditions I had to put up with. She would work as a washerwoman. Uh, she was taking great risks in having me in her house and we would both have summarily executed if the Germans had found out that I was there. By this time, I was aged about 13 or 14 months. I had already been cared for by three different women, two of whom I had never seen before and I was suddenly put in their care. I had no idea how she stopped me crying when I was alone. If I had cried, I would be heard, and that would have been the end of me. 
and for her. The woman now caring for me was very poor and my uncle Dollock continued from time to time to give her money to pay for food and other necessities. During the ensuing years, whenever he was able and, what, and whatever he was doing, he would come and visit and help my, this lady. I found it nearly incredible that he managed to keep in touch so frequently and to provide for me as he did. This continued even when he himself was a prisoner in Plasher and concentration camp and then he was an escaped prisoner and then a wanted man fighting for the partisans. What was it like to live in a cupboard? There was very little room so I could not move about. I had very little to eat, two slices of bread and a drink, water presumably. All I had was myself, nobody talked to and nobody listened to me. I had no toys, indeed I did not know what toy was anyway. I did dare not make a sound in case someone heard me. I do not know how I was taught to be so very careful never to be seen or heard when I was frightened. I had no idea what a normal life was like and I always did just as I was told. Uh, as a result I have learned always to do as I'm told and I found it very difficult when my children were growing up to see any disobedience and even disobedience of adults. The house where I lived was near a Gestapo office and I can still remember peeping through the curtains when I was alone in the house, probably when I was a bit older, and seeing Germans driving in their Mercedes cars. The army was just opposite us, the army base. To this day I dislike Mercedes cars. Similarly, I could see parts of the interior they had carpets on the walls. To this day, I hate the side, the side of wall tapestries. Of course, I had no idea that anything was missing from my life. A child accepts her surroundings and whatever happens must be normal. My grandchildren asked me how I could manage without toys. They do not understand that if you've never had them, you're never going to miss them. It was only when I had my own children that I realised I had had no childhood. One of my granddaughters asked me what I did when I needed the toilet, and I couldn't answer her. I had no idea. Whatever the arrangements were, they were as normal as I was concerned. So what did I do all day? I had a great deal of time, there was nothing else to do. Every now, when I, even now, when I want, I can go to sleep within a minute. And that's quite useful, even when I'm stressed out. When the woman who was looking after me came back from work, I was allowed out of the cupboard and stayed up very late at night, as long as no one called. And night and day were therefore interchanged. Four years is a very long time in the life of a small child and the period between the ages of one and five is normally a full time of full learning and new experiences. So the limit of my experiences during that period have had an enormous effect on my life. I have difficulty with <laughs> lots of things, but I have difficulty with knowing my way around and difficulty with anything technical. In conversation with other child survivors, I have discovered that many of us have the same difficulties. In January 1945, the Red Army liberated Krakow. My uncle had been fighting with the partisans after escaping from Plasho. He was the, he was the, the Pashov is the film that um, Schindler's List was made on. He was a very taciturn man. He's saying very little and never talked about that period of his life except to fellow survivors. 
In later years, when he was aging, he used <coughs> and he was in about when he was about seventy, we've we've managed to see him quite often, and we managed to talk to him and able to fill in some of the gaps in my knowledge. We, we also have a copy of his Spielberg video, so that is how I became much clearer about my early life. When Krakow was liberated by the Red Army, he came to see me, to see how I was, and a few years ago he told me what happened. He took me out of the house, and that was the first time I'd been out for four years, and I said I'm not allowed to go out, and I protested. He found that I knew no words for birds or animals. As far as I was concerned, everything was a pig. He walk, we walked and passed a baker's shop from which were wonderful smells. He saw my reaction and asked me if I was hungry. I said, of course, I'm always hungry. He left me outside of the shop and went in, brought out two rolls. He gave me one. I ate half and gave it back to him. Why are you giving it back? Are you not hungry? I said, that's for tomorrow. You never know what will happen tomorrow. He was a young bachelor, my mother's younger brother, and could not possibly look after a young girl. The woman who'd been caring for me had had enough and just wanted me to be taken away. So he found another home for me out in the country with a couple that he knew because the father had worked in the factory. They had two children and I did not have to be hidden. On the other, <coughs> sorry. On the other hand, there was still a lot of anti-Semitism in Poland and I was described as a member of the family. It took a long time to get used to the different surroundings, to learn to play outside to have a normal day, to go to bed like other children did. I had plenty to eat and was cared for very well and they were very kind to me. One thing I completely forgot for many years until 1979. That was the year my son had his bar mitzvah and my uncle Dalek and his wife came from New York for the occasion. I had not seen him for many years but we had continued writing to each other. His daughter had been to Poland recently and to Krakow and had visited the second family I'd lived with from 1945, 1945 to 1947. She had brought back a photograph which she had persuaded them to give to her and my uncle had brought it with him. My aunt went upstairs to get the photograph. My husband recalls saying to me, don't show it to me, I'll describe it, and I did, in every detail. Until that moment, I had completely forgotten this photograph, but I now recall that they had shown it to me every week, telling me, this is your father, this is your mother, and you must never forget them. And wonderful, I have this photograph still, and it's in the, my bedroom on the wall, we have a wall of photographs of weddings and this one is very important to me. Okay. Thank you. I was, um, I was living with this family until 1947 when posters went up in the area where I was living. They said that a refugee committee was looking for orphaned Jewish children. The man in charge was Rabbi Dr. Solomon Schomfeld, Zechert Sedat Sadik Libraha, who was travelling around from town to town in Poland, putting up posters. On each was a notice that explaining when he would be back at this place and at what time, and he was prepared to take children to England where they would be well looked after. The family who was caring for me saw these notices but they did not want me to go. I was now part of the family. However, they did contact my uncle. At that time he was in a DP camp, displaced persons camp in Vienna. 
and he and they asked him what they should do and he said I should definitely go with Rabbi Schoenfeld. He got he could not look up to me himself and he was sure it was the right thing to do. As I was as a result I was taken by Rabbi Schoenfeld to a ship who brought me with many other children to the United Kingdom. On the ship I met my cousin who was then age 12 for the first time. This is my cousin and me when we first met. He was the third member of my family at that time who I knew had survived. He had spent the war after his parents were taken out in the open, pretending to be a non-Jewish child orphaned by the war. That means he survived on his own until the age of 12. He, was an, this, he has an amazing story, and I have a copy of his Spielberg video too. On the ship, we docked in Leith in Scotland. I have to show you the photograph of us arriving. Use it on his side. And, oh sorry, it's a better picture here. It's the picture. Can you show us where you are in the picture? I will. I'm here, wearing a nice coat with a fur collar, and I don't look as if I'm a star starved child from Poland. Now I want to show you. My cousin is here. So he was with me all the time. On this picture, uh, there's a little boy looking here, there's a little boy who was in hiding all his life. He has no idea who his parents, where his parents were, who they were, his name or anything. And he was starved and you can see by the picture, he was starved. And it's Alex Rosen. And his name is Alex Rosen, Rosen. And here is a somebody who came from Poland with me on the ship and we've met a few times since and she has total recall of anything that happened to her in the war. It's Hannah Greenberg. Her name is Hannah Greenberg. So when we arrived we went to a hostel. I settled very quickly but we all spoke different languages and it was difficult to understand each other. There I really settled quickly and I made many friends. I particularly enjoyed the food which was always available. For the first time in my life I went to school. During this period I was also told of my Jewish background. I had no idea anything about it and I took my first steps in learning about Judaism. Of course, I couldn't understand English, so I did not understand very much during my lessons, but I enjoyed sitting in the back of the class and drawing. The war had been over for two years in England, but there were still very many shortages. For example, food was rationed. This led to the British government putting conditions on our admission to the country. We now have copies of the document that allowed me into the country and in it was a condition that I was to leave the United Kingdom as soon as, some, as a home somewhere else could be found for me, not in England. Rabbi Schoenfeld found a way around this. He found Jewish families willing to adopt each of us. In English law, adoption would automatically give me British nationality. Finding willing families was also difficult because everyone in the country was having a hard time managing financially after the war. With hundreds of other Jewish orphans, I owe an enormous, enormous debt to Rabbi Schoenfeld. May his memory be blessed to Hezek Baruch. Soon, I was the youngest child in the hostel who did not have any relatives or other people to take them. And many couples wanted to take me, but I didn't want to go. 
I didn't want to move again. Above all, I did not want to leave the hostel where I was settled and got to <coughs> and got an unknown and go to an unknown destination. For example, we had really strange stories to, to, to each other. We believed that if we were taken, we would be slaves on a farm. We believed that if we should never go to a family with other children, because they would all treat us very badly. I pretended to be mad. When someone came to look at me, I would hide under the table and scream. Finally, a couple came who were told about my behaviour and they offered to take me shopping, so I went with them. When the day ended, they took me to stay with friends in London. And they would not take me back to the hostel. I could not talk to them because I didn't speak English and they didn't speak Polish. The next day they took me to Southport, which is a seaside town in the north of England. For a while I was quite unhappy, although they were very kind to me, buying me new clothes and treating me with great affection. After some weeks, a social worker from the hostel came to see how I was getting on. She spoke Polish. I told her I was very unhappy and I wanted to return to the hostel, but my wishes were ignored. I now understand why. It was because of the conditions attached to my admission to the country. But at the time I could not understand why nobody would listen to me. In England, legal adoption was an order was made by an order of the court and eventually an adoption order was made even though I had told everybody that would listen that I didn't want to be adopted. I made it very clear to my adopted parents that although they were legally adopting me and changing my surname, I wanted to keep my first name. For many months I would not call them Mummy and Daddy and looking back I can see I gave them a very hard time. For about six months I refused to speak English at all, even though I could really understand a lot because I was going to school. Once, there, once, once that time was over, I soon learned English. In fact, by some incomprehensible psychological process, I can't speak a word of Polish and I do not understand a word. After six months, I came home from school and announced that I would now speak to my adopted parents in English and call them mum and dad. But I told them bluntly that this would save me explaining to everybody why I lived with an uncle and aunt. I must have been horrible to them. Clearly I wasn't very concerned about how they might feel at the time. Looking back also, my education was very limited. I didn't start school until I came to England. It was frequently disrupted. I started school in England not speaking the language and it was many months before I ceased being that funny foreign girl who can't speak proper English. I had no hope of passing my 11 plus examination and I went to an ordinary second modern school. When I was 13, my parents decided to emigrate to America and I found myself in Galveston, Texas, where there were cousins of my adopted father. Of course, again, that involved different schools and I had to adapt to all kinds of new things. Uh, for example, I had just about learned to manage with pounds, shillings and pence, where we were learning dollars and cents. Indeed, everything about America and schools were different from those in England. From Texas, we moved again to Queens in New York where we lived for a few months. We had a really bad time in, 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 <coughs> and returned to England in 1955, going to live in the Manchester area. I had lost my former English friends, now my American friends, and I now had to start finding new friends. And I was, of course, very far, far behind in my schooling. If you have no extended family, as then I didn't, except for my adopted parents, friends are extremely important to me, and I hope I keep them for a long time. 
Fortunately, I joined B'nai Akiva when I was 15 and I was welcomed and soon made new friends. And that, at the age of 15, I met my future husband. By the time I left school, and I went to I went, by the time I left school, I went to secretarial college where I was taught the rudiments of shorthand and typing and general office work. But at that time, my friends were still in school or planning to go to university. I must say also, my parents were very tolerant of my religious practices, even though we lived above the shop and it was open on Shabbat. Friends still came to visit me, going through a back door, not being used to going through the shop. From then on, my boyfriend encouraged me to pursue my education at night school and I passed examinations in some subjects in Eng <coughs> general certificate of English of education, ordinary level. We married shortly after my 21st birthday and we have lived happily after, happily ever after. We have two adopted children, nine grandchildren and three great grandchildren. This photo was taken shortly after my marriage. This is myself and my husband and my adopted parents. Uh, if you look at the picture of my father, he was usually much older than an, a normal age of a parent. They married late in life and they have no other children. In 1964, three years after our marriage, I was accepted on a two-year course to qualify me as a social worker. I did not have the education qualifications to be admitted to university, but this course was designed for people who have had some practical experience and learn on the job. And it gave me a good grounding of the profession. I passed the course examinations and started work in that profession, working as a, as a social worker until I retired on a pension. I really enjoyed my work and my husband still calls me as continuing at being a social worker all the time. I have been told that it was now statistically established that many Holocaust survivors enter the caring profession, so I seem to have followed a common trend. Quite often, I was asked why I never spoke about these things in public. I have discovered that my, <coughs> my experience was shared by many people, indeed most Holocaust survivors that I have met. We were told not to talk about it, not to talk about what happened to us as youngsters. We were told that people did not want to hear these stories because they were upsetting, and, we did, and they did not believe them when they heard them. Personally, I did not really talk about it to anybody. The result was that we might talk about these things to survivors, but we would not talk to them to other outsiders. Anyway, as children, we did not want to be different, and so we kept very quiet about our experiences. When some of my story was finally told in 1997, at the City of Manchester's official Memorial Day, our friends were totally astonished because virtually none of them had had any inkling about my background or my early life. Of course, we, as we get older, we have time to think and remember, but the memories fade with time. Anyway, older people tend to be depressed when calling, recalling bad memories. It is only in the last 30 years that these stories have been told other than the Yad Vashem or other similar institutions. In the year 1998, I heard from my cousin that I had, I had been, that, sorry, that I had found another relative, a very distant cousin, who was alive and well and living in Israel. We went to see her. She lived in a home for the elderly, in <clears throat> not far from Tel Hashomer Hospital. After that, we visited quite often, until she died in 2004. She filled me in with a lot of details of what had happened to my family. At that time, I asked her, when you left Poland to come to Israel, why didn't you take me with you? 
and she said, take you with me. You just screamed and didn't want to leave. It seems to be a pattern that I've had. I have never really discovered what finally happened to my mother, but the new information that we received in 2019 was that she had been part of a group that was transported to a small town some distance from Krakow in Mar on March the 16th, 1941. At present, nothing further has come to light. However, it is clear that she did not survive. Because we don't know the date of her death, I now keep Yom Kippur as her yard site. I don't know anything what happened to my grandparents or anyone else in the family. Indeed, it was only when we got the video of my uncle's testimony that I learned that my mother had a sister who was <coughs> killed by the Germans. Her name was Tosha. I mentioned this earlier. I don't suppose I will ever fill in all these stories, but we keep on trying. When I was a young teenager, I discovered that we did, I had another uncle who was actually a cousin of my father's. He had survived because he had left Poland before the outbreak of the war and then emigrated from Poland to South America. He made a great deal of money but wasn't in contact with me until very recently. I met him once or twice when he visited London and a couple of years after my marriage he actually came to visit me in our new home but we never saw him again and he died a few years later. Over the years I've always missed having relatives of my own, though my husband's family were always good to me. Over the years, I have really missed family. I feel jealous when friends mention that members of their extended family are coming to visit, or vice versa. I can often say, why can't they just say friends? Why do they always call them family? I recall that before my marriage, I was very unhappy, the night before my marriage and I told a friend that I would be missing my mother at the, at the wedding. These days, I count my blessings. I am well, thank God. I'm still happily married. I live in Israel, where, thank God, I have many grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. What else could I want? This is a photograph taken of the family. We were away in the north of Israel, celebrating my husband's 80th birthday. You can see how lucky I am and how well I am on this photograph. I say there are pictures of my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. This is the reason I'm happy. I receive much love from them and I return it. I just want to give you a funny story before I finished. <clears throat> Our family used to recall this. <laughs> Our daughter was sitting cuddling the cat. The cat had come from an animal rescue home. She suddenly said, isn't it sad for daddy? He was the only one in the family who was not adopted. <laughs> they just had to have him. <laughs> So that's as far as I can tell you. Of course, there are other things, but I can't talk for talk. Thank you for listening. Stephanie, can I just ask you, what message do you give to your, your children and grandchildren? And what message do you impart that you've gone through? And Well, a lot of them have heard my story and they are very supportive. In fact, when I first lit one of the candles here, one of the six candles for Memorial Day, my granddaughter was sitting in the audience and she suddenly came right up to me where I was lighting the candle to hold my hand. So she really was feeling for me. And also this year, when I was in memorial service, she made sure that she sat next to me and held my hand. So my children know what the story is. Uh, they've heard me talk about it. They've seen some of the film that I did for the Spielberg Foundation. Um, I think they're a bit amazed by the story, but they know about it and they're very close to me. And advice? What advice do you give? Advice? 
Or what message do you give from what you To listen? be grateful and happy, because I am. I'm grateful to be alive. I'm happy to have a wonderful family. And I tell them they are the ones that make me happy. It's oh, really lovely. <coughs> so I just want to thank you. Uh, so Stephanie, I'm so, personally, I'm so grateful to you um, for telling and relating. And I know it wasn't easy. And um, thank God we came to this day and we managed. We managed, and you've been amazing. Thank and you. you are an example we can all strive to emulate. Thank you. And you should just have muzzle broker at Maybe Stream. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you very much. Okay. Stephanie, can I ask, why were you reluctant to, to have it videoed? Or? Well, for a long time, I have met other survivors. In England, we have the 45 group, which you've probably heard of. And I used to go to their meetings. Of course, all of them had been in concentration camps. And I felt telling my story of being a well-hidden, fed, looked-after child was not much of a story. And since then, I think you've persuaded me and explained to me that it's a story that people should know what hidden children went through. So true. And uh, Tony, if you could just mention a few words, being the son of uh, a survivor and... Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a privilege to be the second generation of a survivor. It's a zechut. Um, Every year on Seder night, we, we always say the uh, the pasuk of Chayav Adam Leot Etatzmo Keilu Hu Yatsa Mimitzrayim, and in order to make that that uh, that message very special, when we come to the part of Yachatz in the Seder, I always mention the story about my mum visiting the bakery, taking the lachmania, taking the uh, bread roll breaking it in half and giving half back to the other person um, and that, that, I think that makes uh, I think that makes the story of Mitzrayim connected the old story uh, the ancient story of Mitzrayim connect to the recent story of Am Yisrael um, the, the significance of, of the broken Matzah is part of the Seder night. The significance of the broken bread is part of there is always tomorrow. That's mum's story. Um, and the Sherit Aplita, which basically from the Sherit Aplita, Am Yisrael was built, was, was rebuilt. And we are Zocher, we are uh, worthy, I don't know why, but we are worthy of living in Eretz Yisrael as a family. Um, I, uh, I had the honor of traveling to, uh, to Poland twice. Um, the second time, the first time was part of the March of the Living before I came on out here. The second time uh, I was uh, part of a, an Israeli army delegation called Edim Bemadim. Um, and I had the very surrealistic experience of telling my mother's story on the cursed ground of Auschwitz. Uh, in military uniform to a group of, uh, of Israeli army officers, uh, men and women who have dedicated themselves uh, and their adult lives in a wide range of professions and, and uh, vocations to making sure that that never happens again, making sure that uh, Am Yisrael Bezrat Hashem will never be subject to the persecution and uh, Slaughter of uh, of evil um, evil non-Jews, um, evil non-Jews who slaughtered are counterbalanced in Mum's story by very good and caring non-Jews who looked after her um, at great personal risk. They, they it, were they to have been caught, they would have paid the ultimate price. Um, Unfortunately, there weren't enough of them to save more people, but those who were are definitely worthy of the name Righteous Gentiles, even though 
for some bureaucratic reason they are not uh, entitled to be called righteous Gentiles by, by Yad Vashem because they received external uh, support their fate would have been the same they would have been greeted with a German bullet or a German um, uh, weapon to kill them uh, whatever whatever their situation was um, every uh, every Holocaust Memorial Day uh, I've taken it upon myself uh, I'm a teacher I teach in high school uh, I teach English in high school uh, and I've taken it upon myself to to tell mum's story um, and uh, and to make sure that the my students know our particular angle, uh, our particular connection, our particular relationship with uh, the story of the Holocaust, with the uh, with the the events of those uh, horrific years uh, in Poland, uh, but also the fact that uh, um, the the fact that Am Israel is, is continuing. Uh, it's not only continuing, but it's it's blossoming and uh, deepening its roots in Eretz Israel and deepening its uh, its roots as a as a nation, as a people. Um, and uh, the, the the positive outcome is a is an outcome of development, of blossoming, of uh, of multiplying. There are now more Jews in Israel than were killed in the Holocaust, which is it's a, ph a phenomenal thought. It's a phenomenal thought. Uh, and uh, this is the message of, of, uh, of the, the days that we're in at the moment, of the Sfira, of the, 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 the terrible loss and tragedy of uh, Rabbi Akiva's prince, uh, disciples. 24,000 disciples were killed uh, in, in the plague. And uh, with the five remaining, or the four or five remaining disciples, Rabbi Akiva rebuilt the entire Torah world, and this is the this is the story. This is the story of Am Yisrael. Twenty percent left Egypt. I don't know what percentage left Poland. It's a lot smaller than twenty percent. Yeah. Um, and they were part. Of, they were part of rebuilding Am Yisrael in its uh, in its homeland. Um, do you want to talk about this photograph? Well, this photograph was, was taken. This photograph was taken uh, uh, at a uh, convention of Holocaust survivors, in which um, mum and dad participated. Um, and uh, I was introduced to Arav Lau, who himself is, of course, a survivor. Uh, and we chatted a few moments. It was very. <laughs> it was like shooting the breeze. It was like a spiel, uh, like a, a schmooze. That, that, that we chatted and. and the, the the picture was taken by Dad, I think. Yes, correct. Yes. You, you took the picture, and I, I think. Okay. I think it it, uh, it tells the, it tells the story of of Amisra. Of, of here is a the Rav, who was uh, Rav Rashi Israel, the chief uh, rabbi, the chief rabbi of Israel, uh, and he was uh, a survivor himself. He was a survivor as a, he survived the camps as a young boy, uh, and here. I'm not blowing my own trumpet or, or saying that I, I, I'm the solution, but, but here is a, a representative of, of the new Israel uh, that has risen from the ashes. Vigada Tel Avincha. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same message. Um, it really encapsulates uh, our history. It does. It, really it does, does. It does. It does. Uh, five years ago, on the uh, uh, the, the Memorial Day. Um, my, my job in the army is, is uh, I'm in the, uh, the early warning unit, uh, the commander of the early warning unit, and uh, on the uh, on the Memorial Day, the Holocaust Memorial Day, as with the Memorial Day for the fallen soldiers and victims of terror, uh, the country um, marks their loss uh, with uh, a, a two-minute-long silence siren, and uh, over the last few years. Uh, it has become a, 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 a custom for a survivor to be chosen to operate the uh, the siren system that morning. And five years ago, we had the honour of uh, of Mum doing that, 
uh, and we sat in the room uh, which, uh, uh, which is responsible for protecting the citizens of Israel uh, and the people who live in this country during times of war and crisis. Uh, and that morning, as it has been doing, done for, for many years, uh, that morning the, the siren was activated by a survivor, again bringing on the message, continuing the message of, of rising out of the ashes, rising out of the, uh, the Holocaust, rising out of tragedy, blossoming, uh, nurt nurturing a, a new nation or a, a, a resurrected nation. Um, and uh, that's that, I think that's uh, that, I think that's the message that uh, that my mum's generation uh, is telling us that no matter what happens, Amisrael will always continue. And uh, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and Leslie, I just want to also thank you, uh, a historian in your own right. But uh, wanted me to tell the story. Yeah, and it was quite fun, really. The organisation, the conference, was the conference of the World Federation, the annual conference of the World Federation of Jewish Child Survivors of the Holocaust. And on this year, in that particular year, it was held in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. And uh, Johnny knew it was coming, we were booked, we attended the conference all the way through. But Johnny, my, our son, <coughs> wanted to come and hear one of the speakers. So he asked me to get hold of the program which wasn't officially published, I got it and uh, I, he, I phoned him up and said I've got the programme, he said read it to me and the opening session of the conference <coughs> was the keynote speaker was Rabbi Lau who was on this photograph and uh, we all sat down at the celebratory dinner, reunion dinner of all these survivors and uh, Eventually, Rabbi Lau made his address. Before he spoke, Johnny arrived. He arrived late because he was coming straight from the army. And he was there in uniform. He walked in, in his best uniform, carrying a gun. And all the survivors going, wow. <laughs> there weren't any youngsters there. And he walked in to join us. And there was a place at the table set for him. And he sat down and got some dinner. And this was a talking point. Rabbi Lau spoke, and after he'd finished, Jonathan made a comment to me that uh, the last time he'd spoken to him was at uh, Maidanek on uh, the March of the Living, the second March of the Living. And I said, well, go and talk to him. There was nobody sitting with Rabbi Lau. His brother was sitting behind him or next to him. It was uh, Naftali. And nobody was talking to him. Yeah, uh, Rabbi Lau's brother, Naftali. Naftali, uh, doesn't matter. Naftali was there and Johnny said all right I will and he walked over and sat down, didn't sit down, he went to smoke travel out and introduced himself and said the last time they'd met was on top of the crematorium and my darling, which was true and Rabbi Lau said sit down and they sat down and they started to talk and while they were talking a queue formed to speak to Rabbi Lau. And I suddenly realised I'd got a camera. Why haven't I taken any pictures? So I went over, but of course I was at the end of the queue, and I leaning out to try and see round the people to see. And the woman in front turned around and said, In Ivrit, what are you doing that for? It's only some soldier. I said, That soldier's my son. Oh, she said. And she moved the whole queue aside so I could take some pictures. And this was the picture, that one of the three pictures that I took. And as you can see, they were chattering away like old friends, though they hadn't met for years, and they really only met once or twice. And uh, that was the picture that resulted. Okay. That's the story you wanted me to tell. There it is. And I think that is the most amazing message. And Johnny, thank you so much. And Stephanie and Leslie, it's been the greatest honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Good. The picture that I'm holding out to you here is a picture of me uh, telling mum's story in the uh, Edim Bemadim program, uh, the delegation, the IDF delegation that I participated in in 2009, uh, telling my mother's story uh, on the the cursed on the cursed land of, uh, of Auschwitz. 
and uh, a few years later um, this is the story this is the picture of mum and me in the, the war room from which uh, the sirens are activated in times of war and uh, on times of memorial Yom HaZikaron LaShoah, the Holocaust Memorial Day and the, uh, the Fallen Soldiers Memorial Day um, on the Holocaust Memorial Day that a survivor is chosen uh, to activate the siren and, and this was a, a picture taken just a few moments before that so it's a very significant picture Thank you so much. This picture shows a, a siren which was situated behind the guard hut at the entrance to Majdanek camp. Majdanek is uh, perhaps the single camp that remains in, in Poland, uh, the only camp that remains in Poland, which is basically left as it was left as it was uh, uh, as it was as it was abandoned by the the prisoners and the the guards and and so on and it looks like a, a camp that is ready to receive new prisoners it's been untouched it, it's it's been untouched and it's been deliberately uh, left as it was abandoned uh, to, to to serve as a, a visit a place to visit in a place of memorial and so on uh, and just behind the the guard hut at the entrance of the camp uh, is this siren. The siren was used in order to call the prisoners to the appel, the, the inspection, the, the daily or the several times a day inspection of the, of the, the camp uh, inmates um, and uh, possibly may have been used as air raid, an air raid siren uh, but uh, when I looked at the siren I noticed that it was made, it was manufactured by the same company that uh, manufactures sirens for Israel nowadays. So there's uh, there's a sort the of like a very exactly the same company. It's a very significant uh, significant photograph. And uh, uh, underneath the picture, I wrote in Hebrew: No longer will Am Yisrael, no longer will the, he the the people of Israel hear the scream of the siren calling them to appel, but they will hear the sound of protection and of mem memory in their homeland. This is amazing. And you, you've worked with uh, sirens in the army. Correct, that's right. That's my, my, my army position is, is, uh, is the unit that is responsible for, for distributing early warning for when uh, Israel is attacked by rockets, planes, mortars. And you have a missiles. picture of your mum and you with a siren. Correct. So I, I think it's on your phone. I, sh I think I should. Yeah, you showed it. Yeah, you can show it again. Yeah, no problem. It's so, so profound. It's uh, here we go. Here's the picture of my mother and I a few moments before she activated the siren five years ago on the uh, National Memorial Day for the Holocaust survivors. Of the, of the people who were killed in the Holocaust, and uh, and it's uh, it's become a custom in our unit that every year a survivor is given the the opportunity to uh, uh, to to signify to mark that, that very very special moment in which the entire country is Same. brought to a standstill, and that is activated by a survivor. Stephanie, it must have been an amazing experience. It was. <laughs> and people phoned me afterwards, they'd seen it, they'd heard about it. Wow, why did you get your... I said, I have connections. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much. Thank you. Stephanie, you mentioned with your son that he went to, to Poland. Mm -hmm. And he put this notice up in English and he read. And then he came back and showed a copy of it for me. And what was the notice? It just said, my mother sent me to say goodbye. He's very emotional, really. He must have been very touched. I couldn't stop crying. When he went, with, you know how they, they march of the living. And then he came back, I think, for half an hour. We just cried together. He was just, you know, 